All right, welcome back. Topic of today is the second half. I'm right with the break. Is we just finished talking about Turing machines today. Uh, we're going to talk about the Church uh, Turing a thesis. Um, this is probably like top five of my favorite lectures in the entire course. Probably one of my favorite, probably one of the most important lectures um, in the entire course. There's really one big takeaway. We're really going to talk about one theorem, one idea. It's not really a theorem, it's really a thesis. So basically, what is the narrative of this course so far? Like, what have we done? Again, to give you the picture, we did what? We did LDFA and NFA and regular expressions, and then we did L, like C of G's, right? Um, and then we did Turing machines, kind of. Uh, I won't say if these are decidable or they're recognizable when I write LTM. Um, but it's kind of obvious that they are greater than this context-free uh, languages. Basically, to summarize the church during the, what we've done so far in the context of what we've done in class, what we've done in class is we've introduced new automata, new kinds of computer, hypothetical models of computation. We've discussed their power relative to each other with the languages they can decide. We've talked about how some are strictly more powerful than others. And we've iterated this through a very weak model, starting with the DFA, simple model, all the way now to the Turing machine. We've done three levels. We've shown that there are languages which are decidable by Turing machines, WW, which are not decidable by CFGs. And we talked about how you might be able to simulate a PDA by pretending that the stack is a, uh, uh, simulating the stack on the tape to pretend that the, uh, the PDA can be done on a Turing machine, something like this. So it appears that Turing machines are more powerful uh, than everything. Um, and these are three different levels that we've had to introduce. The church Turing thesis basically in one sentence uh, says uh, there is no level four. So we're really stuck on level three. Maybe whatever, you make intermediary levels, you know, deterministic context, your grammar is context sensitive, whatever. There is nothing more powerful than the Turing machine. The Turing machine is the most powerful computer ever built. Yet it is incredibly simple in its construction and its design. It only has three instructions, read, write, and move. However, the Church Turing thesis says it, that's it. That's it. It's the, it's the uh, precipice. It's, it, it, that's, it, that's it. End of story. Um, most books kind of like wave this through, and I don't really like that. Every book has, every book on any computer science subject it may have one paragraph in the Church Turing thesis, even if it's not a com even a complexity book. Um, even, but it, they don't do justice to the theorem because some people I've talked to, they're like, it's kind of obvious. Uh, it says something kind of obvious that the that the, so the Turing machine is is the most powerful computer. The Turing machine. is the most uh, powerful computer. So what was I talking about? Anyway, I lost track of myself. But basically, there is no more powerful computer than the Turing machine. You're not going to be able to build something strictly more powerful than the Turing machine. Every time, and we'll talk about this for like three lectures, anytime you could try to build something that's more powerful than the Turing machine, turns out it's as powerful as the Turing machine. The Turing machine has just enough going for it to do anything and everything you could do with an actual computer. Oh, right. Most books kind of hand wave it away. Like the Turing machine effectively models algorithms or something like this. There's like one paragraph in each book. And I'll link you guys. I have a PDF of several books that I've sniped out the one paragraph that they have in the Church Turing thesis. And you can compare their presentation uh, to each other. Seeing 10 people explain the same thing, maybe it'll help you understand this thing. The church Turing thesis, though, is a thesis. It cannot be proved. Uh, some take it as a definition. So you just assume the Turing machine is the most powerful computer. Fine. Definition, then you work under the definition. OK, well, uh, that, may make, that makes me uncomfortable, but maybe it's reasonable. Some take it as you know, a, a working hypothesis. I think this is even a worse characterization. Um, I don't like the fact that no one presents a proof of this, of this statement, even though uh, it's incredibly important. It, all of the previous, the, not the previous, the next things we're going to do depend on the fact that the thesis is true. 
and they only hold that the thesis is true. Yet, just by its definition, there is no Turing machine. The Turing machine is the most powerful computer. That is unprovable. I mean, those have intuitive meanings of words, and we're not working in a strong formal system where you maybe can prove that. So what is that? And so they just kind of regard, like, maybe you can't prove it, and they just take it as the working hypothesis or definition. However, Alan Turing, in his original paper, presents an extremely detailed and extremely serious, convincing argument in favor of the thesis. Uh, and that's basically the goal of today is we're going to present his, uh, his argument, um, mostly. Before we talk about the argument that Alan Turing gave, I want to talk about Alan Turing himself. So Alan Turing was a genius, and, you know, I don't think people respect how good of a genius he was. You know, so, like, growing up, everyone knew the name Einstein as, like, a smartass, right? But no one knew why, like, maybe you didn't know why he was considered such a genius. People, it's not because he looks silly, but if you actually sat down and you took a physics class and you learned some of the things he developed, you think, wow, this is really beautiful, the way he applies this thing. You actually get to respect what, you know, the development of the theory of general relativity or whatever. You understand a respect for the person then for who will develop it. Alan Turing came up with the definition of a Turing machine and came up with several more things. And it is, I think he deserves equal uh, praise. That's why I like to focus kind of on him as well as the material. So first point of view, first thing, Alan Turing comes from a time when uh, there was very few mathematical objects, okay? What were the possible mathematical objects that existed? There was a function. Sets had only been introduced like 20 years earlier. They had only been just invented. So you had functions, you had sets, you had triangles. Um, I think that's it. Every object, every mathematical object you can think of is a function, a set, or a triangle. I can't think of any other primitive mathematical objects around the time. Um, Alan Turing s comes up with uh, the definition of a Turing machine. He's, in some sense, this is foundational for computer science. The fact that you can just, this is computer science uh, distilled. You just make up something, and then you start thinking about it. That is all computer science is. Before, you didn't know you could think, make up stuff. Okay? He was the first person to make stuff up. This is a definition of a Turing machine, and his definition varied slightly and so on. But he said this is, and he, of course, didn't call it a Turing machine. That would be uh, cynical. But he gave up with this definition of a device, and he started reasoning about the device. If you think about the device, though, he was inspired kind of obviously by a typewriter. It is a typewriter. The, you, the typewriter can move left or right uh, and so on. He goes to great lengths, though, uh, because he's working in a time where no one has ever seen a new computer. A com no one knows what a computer is, okay? People do calculations by hand. Uh, he has to convince an audience of his peers that this is an, ex an acceptable definition. So you and I know what a computer is. You and I know what an if statement or a loop is. We have we've worked in a model where we do computation. These guys didn't know what computation was, okay? An abacus was about it. So he has to convince an audience of his peers who are people who study triangles, they're geometers, analysts, set theorists, whatever. They're not certainly computer scientists. Alan Turing is the first computer scientist. So he has to go convince these people this is a good definition. So we're going to present his argument about why the Turing machine is a good definition. Alan Turing also uh, did a lot of other very famous things. He helped, uh, so he solved this problem. He developed the definition of a Turing machine specifically to solve one problem. And we'll talk about what that problem was that he solved. It's called the Church-Turing thesis because Church, Alonzo Church, Princeton, beat Alan Turing to the press by like a few months. He also solved the same problem. He came up with, a, and he came up something, he didn't come up with the Turing machine at all. He came up with a very more complicated proof, a very messier proof. He invented lambda calculus. Have you guys heard lambda calculus? You use lambda calculus as a subset of a programming language, in some sense, lambdas. That's all his, his stuff. Um, it was messy. It was terrible. It did technically solve the same problem, and he had a version of the Church-Turing thesis. But Turing had a much better one. Alonzo Church was some professor at Princeton doing something with students and so on, much older guy. Alan Turing was 22 when he solved this problem. So he solved a very big, very, in a very dramatic, he solved this open problem. Uh, so he solved this problem. Uh, he went to work after World War II, uh, excuse me, during World War II to help the, um, he helped break the Enigma machine. You guys know about the, have you guys heard about the Enigma machine, right? He break the, he invented his own new probability distribution just to calculate something about the, about the letters. And then he was essential for helping uh, the war effort. Um, he was also very gay. Alan Turing, gay, okay? 
He was, uh, and then the government killed him. The government killed Alan Turing. He was in a fight with his, his gay lover. He went to the police. He was like, my, this man broke into my house. And he was like, how do you know the man? He was like, that's my gay lover. So, of course, being gay, illegal. They, chemic, they give him the option, even though he was a, a, a national hero, he was unfortunately British. They gave him the option of going to jail or being chemically castrated. Of course, he's a genius. He's not going to go to jail. That sounds like a bad deal. Chemic, they chemically castrate him through synthetic uh, estrogen or something. He starts growing breasts. Terrible, humiliating. He kills himself. Okay? The one good British guy, okay, and they kill him. It's, disg- it's terrible. It's terrible. They've all kind of made up for it a little bit. They put him on the 50-pound note in 2021. So they still have the queen on there, unfortunately. But they put him on the other side of the bill with um, the thing. They also put, we showed configurations of a Turing machine. They put from his original paper some of his configurations. There was slightly different notation, but the configurations of a Turing machine exist on the 50-pound note from Great Britain. Um, and then he was only forgiven for being gay, like uncharged or whatever, legally. It doesn't matter, he's dead in like 2013. So it took decades and decades for him to be recognized uh, for the power that he did, even though computer scientists were in awe from the beginning, really. Um, then they made a terrible movie about him. Don't recommend you watch the movie. The Imitation Game with the cucumber. Benedict yes, terrible movie. They made, a, they, made a, they made a passionate, romantic movie about his fake straight relationship Gay. Guy was super gay, and they made a movie about the fake straight thing. Come on. And they, had, they, were, both, they were both ugly. They, they had the most beautifulest actresses play the people in this dramatic, and they made him look like a super... You know, sometimes they make these geniuses unlikable and like, I'm so much smarter, and then they have like the, the hollow lens UI pop up for how smart... Whatever. I don't know. They, just, they did this man. It's terrible. Terrible. They're going to hell. I mean... <laughs> Anyway, Alan Turing, uh, I think more important than Einstein in his foundation. The fact that the the takeaway by the Turing machine, the Turing machine definition itself is not that important. The fact that you can make stuff up is what's important. You can come up with a device and start thinking about it. That was fantastic news. Only a few times in history has that ever been done. It was the first time it was done was someone thought of, of a triangle. It's really a Platonistic idea. The idea is an object itself. You can think of a thing and start thinking about it. Okay? Triangles existed thousands of years ago. Uh, late 18th century, 19th, excuse me, late uh, 19th century, someone comes up with the idea of a set. Okay, second big revolution. Turing machine, really the third big revolution. So Alan Turing um, is the greatest. So let's present his thesis. This is a very like not obvious sentence on how, how am I gonna convince you that the Turing machine is the most powerful compu- computer? Uh, this thesis, the proof of this thesis has two parts. So the first part is, Uh, there is no computing device strictly more powerful than the human mind. This is a statement which perhaps is obvious to you, but we, I think, deserve some discussion. The second point... The second point is Turing machines are equivalent in power to the human mind. So the second argument really here is Turing. That's the one we're going to focus on today. But I think the first one is an unstated assumption for most discussion of this. And it requires, um, I think it requires like at least a sentence of discussion. There is no computing device strictly more powerful than the human mind. Okay, so let's try and reason about this. I gave you a DFA. I gave you an NFA. I gave you a PDA, CFT, whatever. 
the way you executed this is you imagined the object in your brain, and then you imagined the input running on the device. So you quite literally simulated the device in your head. So if we have, like, uh, so for example, we proved like LDFA, uh, L, CFG, or PDA. There's a lot here. But these are all certainly contained in a class we could call L human. Right? L human is a very large class of problems. Any class of problems that have a definition in which you can simulate on the neurons in your brain. Okay? Very big class. We're not even sure it doesn't contain everything. Certainly it might contain everything. Every language might be an L human. Um, so if there exists a device such that you can fathom about it, you can reason about the device itself, then that then that entire class is a subset of L human, certainly, right? So the fact that I can give you a DFA in a word and you can do this with your finger means that the, all, the, all the regular languages have to be an L human. Similarly, for the CFGs, the PDAs, and so on, every device that we've talked about so far. Now, is this, first of all, there's not a, like a, a hierarchy of classes in this way. Like you could not have, uh, well, maybe you could in between them, like a limit goes down, but you couldn't have something greater than L human. First off, this is my first claim. What exists here? If anything exists here. So let's start reasoning about what could go out of the system. Like what is the system and what is out of this? What does it mean to be out of the system? If a language is here, it's decidable by L human. It's a human can think about it. If it's here, the human can't think about it. So there is no device that the human couldn't operate or interpret in a way to decide the language. So it's beyond our comprehension. So suppose it was not human. Okay? Suppose it was aliens. Maybe it's aliens, okay? Does the alien device exist? Um, I'm not asking you, do aliens exist? I'm asking you, is there a computational object, a device, which is unoperable by a human? What does that even mean? Is there a definition of an automata I could give you which you could not execute and interpret simply by the limitations of our own brain? Does such a device, is this such a device fathomable or does it exist? So, we can try to prove it, and we're going to do the best that we can. So suppose, suppose it does. Suppose a device exists uh, such that uh, L human is a strict subset of whatever it is. Right? So, first off, why is it a strict subset and not orthogonal? Like, why couldn't it be like this? Right? Why are we assuming that it's like this? So, suppose that it was like orthogonal. If there was languages decidable by a human, not decidable by this alien device, then we could simply augment the device to have a human counterpart, have a human stand next to the computer, and if we run the, the alien computer and the human in parallel. Whichever one returns first uh, returns the answer. So we may augment the alien computer to have a human counterpart so that now it is strictly more powerful and not simply orthogonal. So we have this picture then, if it exists, and not this one. Um, if it's beyond our comprehension, then we couldn't build it. So it has to be aliens. Something. So given a device, any device, car, computer, if you are able to operate it, I also claim that you are able to understand it. Let's try and reason about that, because that is unjustifiable, perhaps. 
if you have a device which is beyond our comprehension, uh, then you couldn't build it, okay? If you're given some sort of alien ceramic computer, picture it, you know, uh, in a way that you can give it strings and it can give you outputs, and you know that it decides something, but you're unable to peek inside the box to understand how it works. Is the box then not useful to us? Like, does, does it mean that we cannot even operate the box? Reason about what kind of objects could exist in an interactive way. We can give it queries and give us answers. It can always say yes or no, but it's not, but we cannot peek behind the curtain. We don't know how it works. What does it mean for that to be true? Yeah. So I don't really, I'm not sure I understand the question fully, but I don't think such a device would be useful for us because if it just tells us yes and no, and we don't know what it's deciding, then it's just like flipping a coin to us. Sure. Yeah. 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 So. Yeah. 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 I would. I don't know about the co the coin analogy exactly because there's some probability involved in there, random oracle kind of stuff. But certainly, if we don't know what it suppose we did know it, what it decides. Suppose we're trying to flesh out the philosophy here. Okay. Uh, the way we're going to do this, we're going to make several small arguments and then hopefully argue that the composition is 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 convincing. Therefore, the argument is convincing. I'm asking you to fathom a device which is interactive. Somehow, perhaps, just for the sake of argument, we have a description of the device, and it tells us what, tells us what language it decides. We have no idea how to understand the machine. We open it up, and perhaps we even provably can't understand the machine. It's provably beyond our comprehension. We see, you see a car, you know, some people only un interact with the car in a black box where you push the pedals, okay? But you can take apart the car and try and understand all the gears if you really wanted to, okay? This device is un beyond our comprehension, we're assuming to the contrary it exists. It's beyond our comprehension, but it's somehow still useful. Can such a device exist? Yes? I thought by saying that there's nothing stronger than a Turing machine, that that's not true. Yeah, we're trying to prove it. Oh. Okay. Yes. So suppose there is something more powerful than Turing. So we're going to convince yourself that I and I and uh, I, I are the proof of the church Turing thesis, right? So we're going to prove that Turing machines are equivalent to the human mind, and then we're going to prove that there's nothing more powerful than the human mind. So first, we're going to talk about the first one, where there is nothing more powerful than the human mind. Once we can reason about that, then we can reason about the Turing machine equivalence to the, to the human mind. So I claim if such a device existed, which was interact interactable, decides a language, and unfathomable, it can't, can't exist. It can't exist in a useful way. Like, we shouldn't be able to comp... We can't comprehend the understanding of the object. I claim we can't even use the object. That, I think, seems reasonable. Think extremely. Any kind of... Any computational... So, we couldn't build it, first of all. Okay? Anything we can build, I claim that we can understand. There are some arguments, like... I think previously someone said, well, we don't understand neural networks. How are we able to build the neural networks? We understand why... We don't understand why things maybe do what they do, but we certainly understand what they do. Like, we don't know how gravity works, but we certainly know very detailed, like, the functions of equations of motion and so on, right? We know, understand all the what's, even if we don't understand the why's. But we, we totally understand the interop inter, inter, interoperation of the machine, right? So if there was a machine we couldn't understand the interoperation of, but we could still use, I claim it couldn't exist. So such a device would be unfathomable. Now, we can't really finish a proof of one, right? Because we can't think about what we can't think about. So I, one, we really can't finish this proof. But we can reason about why we can't finish the proof, and that's sufficient for us to have closure, right? So. So even if it did exist, if it existed in a way that was beyond our comprehension, then it doesn't make sense to discuss it. So suppose it wasn't useful to us. It did exist. It did decide languages. But it couldn't tell us the answer somehow. Maybe fourth dimensional something, whatever, right? We can't fathom it. That's fine. 
just we don't it's 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 unworthy of discussion even you know it's like an agnostic god like you, it's a thought experiment it does something but not in a way that affects us so why do we even think about it why care about it right so so one is sufficiently argued i would think there is no computing device more strictly more powerful than the human mind right if there did exist a device uh, then we could reason about it. If we can't reason about it, then it's not worthy of discussion. That's point one, proven. Point two, Turing machines are equivalent in power to the human mind. This is Alan Turing's argument. And this is a really beautiful argument he has from his original paper. So again, I mentioned he was talking to people who, who came from a... Um, you know, everyone thought, everyone thought they knew what functions and... Um, Everything was a function, a triangle, or a set at this point in history. So he's arguing to people why his definition of the Turing machine is a good one. Let's see if this shows up. So he has, in his original paper, section 9, he has something called the direct appeal to intuition, where he is now arguing that the Turing machine definition that he just came up with is a sufficient model a sufficient characterization of all of computation. That certainly requires more justification. That requires justification, period. You know, the, it's not obvious that the Turing machine is what we would call now Turing complete. It's not obvious that everything that can be done can be done with the Turing machine. Because it only has three instructions. It has a read, write, and a move. And he does this very incredibly beautiful argument um, in his original paper. And again, he came up with this that was, he was only 22. So I have, this, I have these illustrated notes that are available online as well. So Alan Turing published on computable numbers in 1936. Original documents can sometimes possess a greater insight than contemporary texts, especially for new ideas. They are written in a world where no such concept had existed yet, so often the authors will go to great extent to justify and explain rather than define. Turing's idea was to simplify the physical process of someone computing into an abstract idea and then reason only about that. An entire section of his original paper was used to convince the reader that his well-defined machine-based definition of computable encapsulated the natural idea of computable. He gave three arguments, an appeal to, intu an appeal to intuition, a second definition with proof of equivalence to the machine-based one, and numerous examples of numbers that can be computed with Turing machines. Here we annotate, annotate his appeal to intuition. So just to be uh, expository in the other parts, he gave some examples of specific Turing machines that begin with no input and print the digits of E or pi, things like this, using vessel function, or what, I don't exactly remember. But he, gave, he put a lot of work in to convince people that th this is a definition. The moral of the class is we're trying to come up with a definition, a natural definition, of what computation is. Like, computation to you, you sit down and you write, and you do perform a computation. No one would argue that a, a, what you can compute isn't computable. Something is computable if you can do it, right? I said at the first day of class, computation is doing things, okay? So we're trying to find a characterization of doing things. That's what computation is. So first, we have to take what doing things is and boil it down. So I claim you are a person. You are capable of doing things. Okay? But you, as a system, are very complicated. Okay? You have sensory organs and toes and you know what I'm saying? There's things going on. It's a, a human body is a very complex system. Do you need those parts to perform computation? Do you need your skin to perform computation? No. Let's get rid of the skin. Do you need your bones to perform computation? Okay. Do you need any of your life support organs to support computation? Only in the essence of keeping you alive. Let's not reason about them, though, for that. So we're going to take away, we're going to take a person here. I've taken a human being, and I've, and I've um, slaughtered them, essentially. They're living in a jar. I claim these are the only parts necessary for a computation. Okay. First off, certainly the brain. No one argues the brain is not essential for computation. Everyone argues it's, that, is, that is essential. Let me make sure this is centered in the video as well. Yeah, OK, cool. OK, the, the brain is essential for computation. Okay? Undebatable, undeniable. It's essential, important. Okay? Here's a slightly more jump in logic. The eyes are needed for computation. Okay? Computation is not done only in the brain. You may be able to perform mental calculation, fine. But computation requires external uh, input and output. This is a very important step here. So I've kept the eyes, I've kept a hand, 
and the hand is able to read and write to a book. The book is simply paper. Um, that's it. So this is an ideal computing device. So we, again, I, I said we're going to start, we're going to try and make a philosophical argument here. We're going to stop with a sequence of, uh, we're going to start with some basic atomic steps, steps, steps. We're going to try and agree that all these steps are correct. And then we're going to try and agree that the composition has to be correct in order to, quote unquote, prove the first thing. This is an argument given by Turing in his original thing, and I've drawn these pictures to help illustrate it. So let's begin, let's suppose we begin with this photo, okay? This is a computer. We agree anything that is naturally and intuitively computable by you is computable by this cryptid, okay? You may compute something, so may this cryptid. Certainly these are equal. So you are equal to this cryptid. I haven't removed anything essential. If anything, I've left things that are unessential. So certainly uh, that's everything, okay? So here's, a, here's from his original paper. Computing is normally done by writing certain symbols on paper. We may suppose this paper is divided into squares, like a child's arithmetic book. An elementary arithmetic, the two-dimensional character of the paper, is sometimes used. But such a use is avoidable, is always avoidable, and I think that it will be agreed that the two-dimensional character of the paper is no essential of computation. I assume then that the computation is carried out on a one-dimensional paper, i.e., a tape divided into squares. So first remark on boiling down the, the computation. Suppose any, so again, we starting with the assumption, the agreed upon uh, fact that this is a computing device. This cryptid is able to do anything a computer can do. Anything that's naturally computable to you and I is performable by this object. Okay, uh, maybe it's no longer a person. Uh, the first ar notice uh, thing that Turing argues here is that the geometry of the paper doesn't really matter, okay? You use a 2D book line by line, but you could do this in a one-dimensional tape that just goes one line really longly. So the geometry of the paper doesn't matter. The first observation of my attorney is that the physical act of computation is independent of the geometry of the writing surface. You can do the same problems on a book or a scroll or a slate. If you run out of paper, you can always get more. A one-dimensional infinite tape is then the simplest model to consider. There's no difference between being unbounded in both directions or unbounded only in one. The definition of Turing machine we gave is unbounded in only one direction, but it certainly could be unbounded in both. Uh, another thing I want to make here is that there's a difference between infinite and arbitrary. Okay? Turing doesn't say that a Turing machine has infinite tape. He says, quite literally, if you run out of paper, you just can go get more. There is a difference, like if an algorithm takes linear time, no one says it takes infinite time. Okay? It takes increasingly long time on increasingly large inputs, but no one would say it takes infinite time, even if the time as a function of n, like f of n equals n, does diverge. No one would argue it takes infinite time. The Turing machine does not have infinite tape in a useful sense, because we are concerned with computations that stop. If a computation doesn't stop, we're not concerned with it, maybe yet, right? If you use a finite amount of time, you can only also use a finite amount of space, it turns out. So we are concerned not with infinite tape, but with arbitrarily large tape. Could be a lot of tape, but at any moment the computation is stopped, only a finite amount of tape has ever been used. So here's the next picture. I've replaced the book. So we have the book here, right? The book, I quite literally replaced the book with the tape. So we're making our first assumption, second assumption maybe, uh, second atomic fact has been argued. The book and the tape are equivalent, right? I shall also suppose that the number of symbols which may be printed is finite. If we were to allow an infinity of symbols, then there would be symbols differing to an arbitrarily small extent. And there's a footnote here I'll, I'll discuss in a second. The effect of this restriction of the number of symbols is not very serious. It is always possible to use sequences of symbols in place of single symbols. Thus, an Arabic numeral, such as 17, or several nines, is normally treated as a single symbol. Similarly, in any European language, words are treated as a single symbols. Chinese, however, attempts to have an innumerable infinity of symbols. I think I looked this up. I think Chinese still has finitely many symbols, but there's just a lot of them. Um, so what he's really saying here in this paragraph is that the alphabet is finite. The Turing machine has a finite alphabet. That's why it's important that the alphabet be finite. It, I think there may have been a question at the beginning of class, like what happens if the DFA has an infinite alphabet or something like this? No. The, by definition, the, the alphabet is finite. Um, the footnote, he uh, makes this remark. He says something like, 
if there was, suppose there was an infinitely many symbols, uh, many of them would be indistinguishable from each other. So consider the space of, again, consider the tape. Consider the patterns of ink you could mark on the tape. Consider the space of all possible patterns you can mark on a single cell, like a one by one tape cell. Consider all the patterns of ink as dots. He claims most of them would be indistinguishable from each other. Most of them would look similar, and they would group themselves into certain classes. He uses the word compact. You guys know the definition of compact in a metric space or topological space? I don't think so. You guys heard the word definite? The definition, a compact uh, space is one where every open cover has a finite subcover. Whatever. So basically, if there did exist infinitely many symbols, he argues many of them would look too close to each other, and you then only can reason about finitely many of them anyway, right? There are many ways to write the symbol A. We write it like, uh, you can write it like this, or I guess that was the wrong font. Or like G and F, right? We use different things to represent, the, we use different patterns and strokes to represent the same object. So he argues, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, it's only safe to consider finitely many. If you want to represent a larger object, just use a sequence of symbols. The size of the tape alphabet has no effect on the possible computation being done. Arithmetic may be easier in one base versus another, but can always be done in any base. The properties of this machine we wish to study are independent of the base size, much like how primality of an integer is independent of the base we are presented in. So again, uh, 17 is a prime number, but we write 17 as a 1 and a 7. Okay? The object 1 and a 7 itself is not prime. That's just a description of the idea of the number 17. And the idea of the number 17 is what's prime. We may write 17 in a different base. It has more than one representation. And the property of the, the primality is a property of the object, the idea of the number 17, and not of the representation. So we are concerned with properties of languages like we are concerned with properties of numbers. We're not concerned with the way you can represent the numbers, but we just use the, the representation as a way to think about the object. Okay. We have to write something on the board. So we use a 1 and a 7 to represent 17. But the primality is independent of the way we write it. The behavior at the computer at any moment is determined by the symbols which he is observing and his state of mind at that moment. We may suppose that there is a bound B to the number of symbols or squares which the computer can observe at any moment. If he wishes to observe more, he must use successive operation, observations. This is actually a subtle but extremely important point here. He's basically saying the tape can only look at a finite amount of squares at any moment. Okay? It, if it wants to, to look at more squares, it has to use more than one operation. This ends up being actually essential for complexity, it turns out. Um, we, we gave an, uh, a Turing machine which takes some input its tape and it flips every bit. Okay? There is no finite, there is no computer which can flip every cell of the tape uh, in one step, okay? Implicitly here is a, a very physical restriction. The Turing machine in finite unit time can only do finite work, right? It cannot do arbitrarily large work in unit time, right? If you were to flip symbols, if you were to ask to flip a bit string, uh, you would take time proportional to the length of the string you're flipping, okay? There is no way for you to naturally do things. You, humans can't do things except one at a time, okay? So it's, neither can the Turing machine. It's restricted in this way to look at only finitely many squares. You as a computer can only process information from a finite amount of sources. IAs are a complex biological system, but an easy simplification of this is the tape head. It can only read or write to a fixed finite number of cells in a single step. So here... I replace the hand, the eye, the input and output system to the brain. I have replaced that with a single, like a paper clip with a wire here, okay? It is allowed to measure exactly one cell at a time. Turing here, he says B, doesn't matter, okay? I, uh, our definition of a Turing machine says one. We read one cell when we write to one cell. Convince yourself, though, that you could probably have an equivalent definition of a Turing machine which reads and writes to two cells or three cells, and it shouldn't make too much of a difference, right? We will also suppose that the number of states of mind which, be take, which need be taken into account is finite. The reasons for this are of the same character as those which restrict the number of symbols. If we admit an infinity of states of mind, some of them will be arbitrarily close and we will be confused. Again, the restriction is not one which is seriously affects computation, since the use of more complicated states of mind can be avoided by writing more symbols of the tape. 
So here is a huge uh, and very important detail here. Q, the set of states as we've defined it, is finite. The brain operates between finite states of mind, and that's the word where the word state comes from. We, we could have used the word vertex or node when we talked about a graph, a DFA, but instead we use, chose the word state, and it becomes it comes from, etymologically from the words from the from the phrase state of mind. You're in a certain mindset when you're thinking about doing something, and then when you see a different input or output, you translate yourself to a different state of mind. You operate between these states of mind. Turing argues there's only finitely many, for the same reason there's a finite alphabet. If there was infinitely many states of mind, uh, then certainly some of them would be confused and be arbitrarily close. It doesn't make sense to discuss this. He also says later on somewhere else, oh, I say it here, Turing states earlier that the justification lies in the fact that the human memory is necessarily limited. The brain is made up of finite matter, so memory must also be finite. If you suppose the existence of a Turing machine with an infinite numbers, number of states, then such a machine exists to decide every language. Compu computing structures are necessarily finite in description. So I made you guys prove that on homework one as well, right? Do you remember the DIA? I asked you to prove that every language is decidable by DIA. This is particularly why. It's kind of useless for us to talk about an infinite sized machine when we are finite beings in our interaction and our, our matter, okay? We're concerned with the finite object, finite states, finite alphabet. We may now construct a machine to do the work of this computer. To each state of mind, the computer corresponds an M configuration of the machine. The machine scans B squares corresponding to the B squares observed by the computer. And any move, and by the way, the word computer here means something different to us than it did to him. Computer to him meant like, you know, some of these departments of war would hire students like graduated students to go compute differential equations all day. So you were literally there performing calculation tax, tasks. He means, by computer, he means a person. The machine scans B squares corresponding to the B squares observed by the computer. And any move the machine can change a symbol on a scan square or can change any one of the scan squares to another square distant not more than L squares from one of the other scan squares. The move which is done and succeeding configure, uh, the move which is done and the succeeding configuration are determined by the scan symbol and the M configuration. So there's two things here. One, not only can you read from a finite amount of squares, but you can only move to a finite amount of squares. So our simplest model is we take L and B to be one. So you move left or right one square at a time, you can read and write one square at a time. So that's the reason our definition is exactly what it is. The entire state of the system is uniquely determined by the current quote unquote state of mind, the configuration. The tape head is allowed to move left or right but only some finite number. This passage also enforces that the machine is deterministic. So the succeeding configuration is determined by the current, the scan square and the M configuration. The M configuration is the previous configuration of the machine. The scan symbol is the symbol you're reading. So the next step is uniquely determined by the previous step and what you're reading. This enforces the definition, even though we didn't say it out loud, it's kind of old. The definition of a Turing machine is itself deterministic. The definition we gave is a deterministic Turing machine. So I have now replaced the brain, and this is probably the largest jump. I've replaced the brain. We've argued about the input and output. There is only finite states of mind. Let's just replace the brain with finite states and a transition function that operates between this. This is the biggest jump in logic because the brain is the most complicated organ. It's been 20 careers to understanding it. We still have it. Neuroscience is its own thing. Machine learning is doing its own thing, whatever. But this is the greatest jump in logic uh, and our last one where we replace the brain with the finite states of mind. The in thinking, about, uh, thinking about thinking can be quite difficult, but distilling computation to its bare essentials, the Turing machine as a mathematical object can be reasoned about quite easily. This kind of justification was necessary to convince the reader that a Turing machine and, a human, a, and human computation are the same. So let's review what the argument is that we've, uh, that we've done so far. So we, we, we have almost but certainly proved the church turing thesis. There is no computing device strictly more powerful than the human mind. Fine. 
Turing machines are equivalent to power in the human mind. That's what we set out to prove. That's what, we, that's what Turing argued, and that's what we've displayed here. We gave a sequence of atomic operations. We replaced, we took a computation. We stripped out all the meat. We took some of the bones. Uh, we replaced each of it object piece by piece with a simplification. We replaced the book with the tape, the input and output system, the eyes and the hand. Very complex organ, by the way. The eye is very complicated, hand very complicated. We replaced it with a paper clip and just supposed a signal was sent in some way. We replaced the brain with a seek finite set of states. In each step, we've tried to boil down that we didn't make, we didn't jump to any conclusions, but that each operation was well and justified. And now we need to argue that the composition is justified. If you make a sequence of correct moves, certainly then the output should be correct. Most of the time, the composition of correct things is going to be correct. So really, we have no choice but to accept the fact uh, of point number two. Turing machines are equivalent in power uh, to the human mind. Given that, we can safely say here that the Turing machines are exactly this class. I lost my marker. That is the church turing thesis. Anything that is fathomable or computable or naturally intuitively computable by you and I is computable by a Turing machine. So convince yourself that we gave kind of toy algorithms for Turing machines. We gave this or that, you know, we gave a w, one for PWW. I claim anything that there is an algorithm for, you can give a Turing machine for. That is what it means. Uh, that is what the church turing thesis says. Let me give you a... Uh, just like as a final thing, a fi as a formal um, definition of the church string thesis, which we can use to apply. For any kind of mechanical process or decision procedure or whatever, C, uh, for all C, we can simulate the C on our brain. So every class of other automata you can come up with is a subset of the class uh, Turing machines. Right? Anything you can think about reasonably you could build can be simulated by, you can create a Turing machine to do something equivalent. If we can rephrase this also as there does not exist a C such that uh, C is strictly more powerful. So C is not greater. There's no, there does not exist a greater uh, C. All right, two last little points here. Um, I, we could only kind of, it's a thesis, so we can't prove it. This is the best we can do. There's two kind of things to hear. One, I mentioned, I didn't give a formal definition of what was a subset of the Turing machine because it could apply to many things. It could apply to classes of functions or whatever, under appropriate translations. So I'm, but I'm talking about any kind of mechanical process or decision procedure or automata or computer. Any of those can be converted to something that can be simulated on a Turing machine. Uh, implicit here is the state is actually two statements about physics. One, we're concerned with uh, computable devices that are physically realizable. So we could have just said, of course, the Turing machine definition is made up, but it is inspired through our natural processes. We could have just said, suppose there exists a ma machine and a single instruction is allowed to flip all its bits on the input, on the tape, okay? Suppose it can do an infinite amount of work in constant time. That's allowed. You can just say things. You can make things up and reason about it, okay? But then you can't say, 
it's, it's, you can't say anything about our natural definition of computation. We're trying to have a natural definition of computation. So implicit with that is, is limitations of our own natural world. So we're concerned with devices that are real and not something hypothetical and unimagined. So implicit, actually, in, in the kind of argument we gave today, is sort of two, at least two, um, two traits. One, um, program descriptions... have finite length. So again, it doesn't make sense for what a program to be infinitely long. Like, similar to the DIA, you could decide every language. Just hard code the language as a lookup table in the infinite size program. So an infinite size program is, is not practical or useful in any way to us. It doesn't, it's, we are certainly only limited by devices which are finite in description. Okay. You have a bicycle. You can enumerate the parts of the bicycle. You can, just, you can describe the bicycle finitely. Even to an overly precise area, you could tell everyone where each molecule is or whatever. It's going to be a finite description of the object. That's perhaps too detailed, but ob the objects we con are concerned with are going to have finite description, certainly. Um, constant work, or I should say finite. Finite work is done in unit time. So unit time means a single step. So the machine performs steps. Also, another, another thing here is that, is that computation is a process. Computation is something that happens as a sequence of steps and not the immediate outcome. So we could have tried to make a functional definition of naturally computable, which other people have done historically in the past, where we, we just have a function, not an ideal algorithm or anything related to an algorithm to work. An algorithm is a sequence of steps. Things happen, okay? Doing things don't happen in one step. They do happen as a sequence of steps. Uh, in each step, only a finite amount of work can be done. That is another implicit assumption we've made uh, on our own limitations that we've applied to the Turing machine. So this is uh, the Church-Turing thesis. Yes? Yes? 